This is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and welcome to our worship here at our Redeemer Lutheran Church in Jacksonville, Florida. I think all of you in the sanctuary know where you're at, but I always say that in behalf of those that may be joining us from distant places through our live stream or through our Redeemer Lutheran radio. We are so happy to have you in the sanctuary today for this uh, seventh Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, today I continue the sermon series called uh, Go, a Church Active in Mission. Each week we have been looking at uh, an appointed reading that uses the word go to show us what the Lord wants us to be about. And the verse for today is from Isaiah 55. You shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. And so most of the hymns today are hymns that speak about joy. The psalmist says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go unto the house of the Lord. And I am glad that you are here today. It's also a special day for us as we have representatives from Alliance Defending Freedom. They will bring greetings during the service, but we'll have more time during our potluck today to talk about the work that they are doing in behalf of Christian churches and individuals, other organizations, and also uh, Jewish, uh, uh, some Jewish interests when their freedom of speech or other rights are challenged by the radical left. I think you're going to find it very interesting. You have a fact sheet in the bulletin that you will definitely want to hear uh, from our special guests, Adam and Ryan from ADF. There will be time during the luncheon to ask questions as well, so we are so happy to have them here today. We begin by joining together in our first hymn, Rejoice, O Pilgrim Throng, uh, as printed in our worship folder. And please note that we will ri we'll rise for the final verse. Oh 
Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it, and it's gone and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Glory, Glory be, to be to the, the Father, Father, and to the Son, and, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it now and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is great, is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Blessed Lord, since you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, 
that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Before we have the scripture readings, you may be seated for a medley of joy songs. I've got the joy, and the joy of the Lord is my strength, and rejoice in the Lord all. note that following the first, uh, following the uh, e uh, Old Testament and the epistle, we have the response as indicated. The first reading. I don't know what I've done to deserve such attention, but I appreciate it, John. <laughs> the Old Testament is from Isaiah, the 55th chapter, beginning in the 10th verse. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I propose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson is found in Romans, the eighth chapter, starting with the twelfth verse. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, you, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you do not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. 
but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Amen. As 
we uh, prepare to uh, join in the sermon hymn, you will find it printed in the bulletin, it's Bringing in the Sheaves. You may be seated as we sing. <laughs> continue the sermon series, Go, a church active in mission, we're looking at yet another text that uses that particular word. And don't you love Isaiah 55, 10 through 12, reading again at this point only verse 12, for you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. We'll consider both parts of this promise as we also share in the theme, go forth in peace joy. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, it's difficult for us to imagine what it was like all those years ago, some 700 years before Jesus, when the prophet Isaiah was inspired to write these words to encourage the Jewish people who would be taken into captivity in Babylon. And yet we understand that today there are great dangers facing the church too. And so we claim your promise that you will lead us forth in victory and at long last we will go out of this world to be with Christ in heaven. But until that time you give us work to do and a message to proclaim. And we pray for your spirit's help and blessing to that end. In Jesus' name. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, let me ask you, are you an optimist or are you a pessimist? Are you a glass half empty person or the glass half full person? Do you complain that rose bushes have thorns or do you rejoice because thorns have roses? Do you see the storm clouds or do you see the silver lining? Do you complain when it's a rainy day? 
or do you look for the rainbow instead? You might have seen a picture uh, this week from a tornado that hit the Chicago area, I believe it was, where there was a tornado clearly pictured in a double rainbow behind it. Did any of you see that in, in the weather reports? It was incredible. I believe that we are people who can see the rainbow through the rain. You shall go out in joy. I think you'll agree that that's a very positive thing to say. It's the sentiment of an optimist, not a pessimist. Who wrote these words in what was the historical context of his message? You really can't appreciate those words or promises without knowing the background. And so it was the prophet Isaiah who wrote them about 700 years before the birth of Jesus. It was not just positive thinking or the daydreams of an optimist which led him to write those words to the Jewish people. Rather, it was the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who sent the prophet and gave him these positive but powerful words of promise. Now, the promise was first directed to the people of the southern kingdom of Judah. He had been prophesying that they should repent of their sin and return to the Lord, and dire things would happen if they did not do so. And yet, in the latter part of his prophecy, he was also inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak these words of hope and encouragement and even foretell the time that they would be freed from their captivity. Those words spoken by Isaiah, uh, the words of the Lord spoken first to Judah, are also directed to you and me. And so it was about 740 B.C. that God commanded Isaiah the prophet to write these words. In the first 39 chapters of his, his prophecy, as I mentioned, he warns uh, of the need to repent uh, of sin and return to the Lord. He foretells destruction if the nation did not respond. And during his lifetime in the year 721 B.C., the northern kingdom fell to the Assyrians, as other prophets had warned, if they, the, people, the Jews of the northern kingdom, did, did not repent. Well, Isaiah's hope was that the people to whom he spoke would avoid the destruction of their nation. But sadly, in 586 B.C., some 135 years later, Judah also fell. But God had inspired the prophet in chapters 40 and following, of his prophecy to write wonderful words of hope and comfort. In fact, Isaiah 40 includes the words which you may remember that are often read during the Advent season. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, says your God. Now Matthew Henry in his commentary says, Before God sent his people into captivity, he furnished them with precious promises for their support and comfort in their trouble. And we may well imagine of what great use to them the gracious, glorious light of this prophecy was in that cloudy and dark day and how much it helped to dry up their tears by the rivers of Babylon. But it looks further yet into greater things, much of Christ and gospel grace. This gracious discovery of God's goodwill to the children of men through the Messiah, whom Isaiah foretold, is not to be confined either to Jew or to Gentile, to the Old Testament or to or the New, much less confined only to the captives in Babylon. Henry concludes, no. Both the precepts and the promises are given to all, to everyone that thirsts after happiness. End of quote. That means these words are directed to you and me too. You shall go out in joy was first the promise given to the Jews that despite 70 years of captivity in Babylon, a remnant would one day return to their homeland. They shall go out of their captivity, Henry says, and be led forth toward their own land again. 
God will go, go before them as surely as before their fathers in the pillar of cloud and fire. They shall go out, not with trembling, but with triumph, not with any regret to part with Babylon or any fear of being fetched back, but with joy and peace. Their journey home over the mountain shall be pleasant, and they shall have the goodwill and good wishes of all of the countries they pass through. And amazingly, God did all of this through King Cyrus of Persia, Arctic Xerxes, and other leaders as he worked all things together for the good of his people who loved and trusted in him. And so the words of the Lord spoken by the prophet Isaiah were just what the pessimistic, pessimistic captives in Babylon needed to hear. And their sad hopelessness, they had said, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged up our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there, they that carried us away captive required of us, of, of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? They asked. And yet the music did continue. The joy was renewed as later the nation was restored to its homeland. In due time, the walls of the city of Jerusalem were built up to the work of Nehemiah, and the temple was rebuilt, and worship once there, uh, once again began in that sacred place. You see, it's God's precious promises that restored their joy and renewed their hope. It was not what men did, but it was what, it was what God said and what God did. And so the word of the Lord assured them that all was not lost. The future was bright with the light of the coming Messiah. You shall go out in joy. And some of them lived to see that day when they were able to return home as a remnant of the Jewish people. For many others, however, they did not see that day, but they welcomed it from afar. They treasured God's word in hearts of faith. And they believed that God would do what he said. God's promises for you and me will also be kept, every last one of them, in full accomplishment of his plans and his purpose for us. The word of the Lord endures forever. And Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. As one author put it, these promises of mercy and grace shall have as real an effect upon the souls of believers for their sanctification and comfort as ever the rain had upon the earth to make it fruitful. Christian friends, we are living in troubling times, as did Isaiah. Many people fear that our nation has taken such a turn away from the Lord and to such a degree that it may be impossible to avoid destruction. I hear many people express their concern about the future of the United States, especially for their children and grandchildren. Now, on YouTube, you can view a lot of very pessimistic videos that make it sound like it's already too late, there's nothing that can be done, so you better begin hoarding food and other supplies and make sure you got lots of gun, guns and ammunition. And then there are others who play the part of the eternal optimist and say that everything will be okay, and even though it, even though it may not be, they adopt the don't worry, be, at, be happy attitude, and just plan their next party. I believe that neither of these approaches provides the comfort and encouragement we need. The only way for us to live is with our eyes fixed on Jesus and with a firm grasp on his promises and to live as people who are fervent in prayer for our nation, for our leaders, for the church, and for ourselves, our families, and others. Yes, we live by word and prayer. 
We live with faith in God's promises because the, the, there is power in the promises of God not only to transform our outlook, how things appear to us, but there's also power in the promises of God to transform our lives and our circumstances. This power comes from the very nature of God himself, in that God always does what he says. He keeps his promises. Jesus prayed, Father, sanctify them in thy truth. Thy word is truth. Jesus believed that the Old Testament scriptures were true in their entirety because they are the inspired word of God. This is why we as members of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, also believe in the inspired and errant uh, uh, word of God, the Bible, uh, God's message to, to all of us. Nicholas Coy comments on the promise, you shall go out in joy, and he says, in our Old Testament reading, we see the foundation and confidence for such a promise. Plant it, and it will grow. God starts by using a simile to introduce his promise. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven, do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I propose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. It's the all-powerful word of God that was active in creation that is still working for you and me. The word of God is able to accomplish whatever God has in his heart and mind for us. I believe that the promise you shall go out in joy is a word badly needed today. I think that Christians are to be positively cheerful pe people because of God's promises. The prophet Nehemiah is the one that said, the joy of the Lord is our strength. St. Paul was able to endure his imprisonments and sufferings because of his joy in Jesus and even those in a Roman prison, not knowing if he would live or he, he would die, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Joy is, re is defined in Webster's Dictionary as exhilaration of spirit. Reverend Dr. Matthew Harrison, who was recently reelected as the president of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, wrote a book called a little book of joy. Well, the title sums up its contents as he speaks of the joy of knowing Jesus, the joy of the Holy Spirit, the joy of worship, the joy of God's mission, the joy of family, and many of the other joys which fill our lives. And he, he says this, the Bible is a book about Jesus, but more than that, the Bible actually delivers Jesus to us in divine words which are living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. It's more possible, it's more than possible, he writes, for us to live a good news life in a bad news world. It's God's great pleasure and desire for us to do so. But if it is to be a life which knows true joy, it shall be a joy in perspective. And then he explains by relating uh, a time when he had gone to Africa uh, and they were staying some 50 miles from Mount Kilimanjaro, but they, they hadn't seen it because it was uh, overcast all day long. So the next morning he gets up, he goes outside to walk bright and early, and suddenly the clouds parted, and there was the 20,000-foot-high mountain off in the distance. It appeared majestically before him, and he, he writes, Most of the time, we will, live, we will view life from the perspective of a trek in the mud, as on a rainy day. It will be rough going, dirty, and often dangerous. But by faith... We know the mountains there, and by the same faith we share its joy. Through the prophecy of Isaiah, you see, the Jews could see Mount Zion shining in the distance. They trusted that a remnant would return. You and I 
are able to get through suffering, accept disappointment, deal with the problems that come, even the unknown dangers that may be facing the church, because we see Mount Zion shining in the distance, the kingdom of heaven, and because we live by faith in God's promises. You shall go out in joy. The second part of the text is the second promise. You shall be led forth in peace. Do any of you remember the movie Field of Dreams? Okay. Of course, uh, it was filmed on location in Dyersville, Iowa, a small town and a couple of hours from where I grew up. Uh, it's still possible to go to the Field of Dreams. In fact, occasionally they'll have a major league ball game in the middle of the cornfield. And the story, of course, uh, very briefly, uh, uh, Kevin Costner played the lead role, role of Ray Kinsella, an Iowa farmer who heard a voice, which he understood to be God, saying, build it and they will come. So he plowed up the, cro the, the uh, cornfield, much to the dismay of his worried wife and other family members, and much to the laughter of his neighbors, he built the ball field complete with lights and bleachers, and then he waited. Who would come, he wondered. Then one day, he saw great ghostly figures, great baseball players from the past coming out of the cornfield, including a young man whom he understood to be his deceased father. Well, so he comes out of the corn and he says, Hooray, is this heaven? To which his son responds, no, it's only Iowa, which being an Iowan, I think, is one of the greatest lines of all. No, it's just Iowa. But the phrase that really stuck with a lot of people is build it and they will come. Build it and they will come. Plant it and they will grow. Now, in the fanciful movie, Ray couldn't explain how it all happened. It just did. Let's admit that we don't have all of the answers either. You will be led forth in peace, you see, if you simply let God do his work. In the parable of the sower and the seed, Jesus tells us that some of the seed fell on the path or among the thorns uh, and the like, and some fell on the good soil. We cannot control who will respond or how they will respond when we sow the seeds of the gospel, sharing Christ with them. Jesus also told Nicodemus, the wind blows where it wills. We hear the sound of it, but we do not, you do not know whence it comes or wh whither it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. We know that God works through his word, but we can't know where it's going, and we can't even always see what effect it is having. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. And we may go forth in peace, simply letting God do his work. We can have the calm, quiet assurance that if we are sowing the seed of the gospel, telling people about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God is going to bless it. He is going to make sure that his word does not return empty. Now, following the parable of the sower and the seed in Mark's gospel, we have this verse. And he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring up and grow, he knoweth not how. As the old hymn says, God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. So let us go forth in peace, simply letting God do his work and trusting that he will. And finally, you will be led forth in peace as you leave the results to God. Now, most of us as Americans like to get quick results, don't we? It can be frustrating to wait for things to happen, and yet that is so typical in life. Now, we might wish that there were some miracle formula for achieving our personal goals or for building the kingdom of God, but all we can really count on is God's promises. Jesus says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell 
will not prevail against it. He promises to build his church, but at the same time he makes it clear that, he, that the devil and all the demons of hell are working against him and by implication working against us too. To that, St. Paul says, have no anxiety about anything, but pray about everything. The Lord wants you and me to have the peace of God that passes all understanding, and that comes by faith in his promises. To have faith means that you trust God not only to do his work in his own way and in his own time, but that you also leave the results to him. Today we will be hearing from Alliance Defending Freedom leaders about the work which is being done around our country to defend Christians, churches, and other organizations from legal attacks by those who object to our Christian beliefs and values. They would like to deny us the God-given freedoms that are enshrined in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights as our nation becomes more godless and immoral, we can be sure that those attacks will increase, but we do not fear, rather, as people of faith. We pray, we claim those promises, and we go on sowing the seed of the gospel. We're grateful for ADF, the aid that it has given to many Christians, to churches, to Christian schools, other organizations. The work which ADF does through its many lawyers and other staff members and volunteers has got to take a lot of time and patience, doesn't it? I'm sure that they could wish that there would be a quick, positive settlement to all of the cases with which uh, they contend. But instead, we know that it takes a lot of time, and a lot of money, a lot of waiting. Isn't that true of your life and mine? David says in Psalm 27, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. Yet wait, I say, on the Lord. In Proverbs 20, King Solomon writes, Say not thou, I will recompense evil, but wait on the Lord, and he will save thee. Therefore we let God do his work, even as he accomplished his saving work through his son, Jesus Christ, as prophesied by Isaiah. Jesus came in fulfillment of all of the prophets of the Old Testament. Our Lord Jesus said, I must do the work of him who sent me while it is day. Well, that saving work, as you know, led him finally to a cross where he suffered and died in agony, for you and me. He did that to pay for our sins and to make us right with God and to open the way to heaven to all who believe. But before he gave up his spirit and died, he also said to tell us die. It's finished. Paid in full. The job is done. Yes, thank God that Jesus did the work of salvation for you and me so also we may trust him to complete his work, fulfill his purpose. Therefore, we will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. God grant it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses our human understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. At this time we receive today's offering. Please note that there will also be a door offering at each door for the work of ADF uh, as we're leaving the sanctuary.
prayers this morning, we would remember Art and Jennifer Gustafson as they're driving to Minnesota. And they're going to Minnesota to fetch back their son, Artie, who has enjoyed spending the summer with his grandparents. We would also pray for Tim uh, Freeman, uh, who is a friend of Robin and Richard Paris. He's 34 years old, uh, dealing with uh, heart trouble and diabetes. We'd also um, pray for Judy. Uh, this is the stepmother of Cheryl Cobb, uh, daughter-in-law of Kathy Cobb, who is our lecturer today. Judy is dealing with uh, lung cancer and is in hospice care. Uh, certainly, we're also going to pray for the Lord's blessing upon ADF uh, and all the important work that they do for the church. You also find uh, the lengthy prayer list in your bulletin from weeks past. And we're happy to have Robin Paris with us uh, and doing better despite a, is it a broken toe. And we know that even the smallest part of the body can cause a lot of pain, can it? So pr prayers continue for all of the folks there, um, and we're grateful for that. Also, uh, we wanted to, I wanted to call your attention to, I think I have the bulletin, that we are very excited uh, that after our uh, baptism family night last uh, Sunday evening, we do have 10 children and two of the moms who are going to be baptized on one Super Sunday, that will be August 13th. Uh, and we will be having our potluck that day instead of the third Sunday. Um, and the ladies have agreed to change their date because of this extraordinary event, something I've never experienced, uh, 12 baptisms on one day. And so we're grateful to the Lord, and we thank him for working in the lives of people. Um, of course, following this service, we're going to be having a potluck, and we encourage you all to stay. We all bring extra so that our guests are able to join us. And uh, speaking of guests, I want before I have Adam come up, I want to have his mom and his brother Ethan stand there in the back, the back corner of the church. So his mom, Kathy, was a member of the church, and last night at our home was the first time in at least 35 years that I saw mom and two sons together. Uh, we've all changed some, and they don't look like the little kids that they did back then. Well, I guess you were a teenager, but uh, so good to reconnect. And with that introduction, uh, I invite Adam Mayaski from ADF to come forward. This do the trick? Yep. That's okay? Oh, well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. And thank you, Pastor Bill, for that recognition and introduction. And thank you, Susan, for all that you both have done to welcome us. Uh, it's an absolute honor to finally get to visit you here at Our Redeemer Lutheran after all these years. And the invitation we're grateful for to share some of the important work God has in store through Alliance Defending Freedom. But... I am, if you all have not met Ryan yet, Ryan, would you just wave your hand so they know who you are? That's my colleague, our fearless leader, and you'll hear from him uh, during the presentation, uh, but we just are grateful to be here. Well, I'm only going to spend a couple of moments giving you a sneak preview, a trailer, if you will, of the more detailed presentation that Ryan will do for those of you who will stay with us, but first, just a quick personal note, if you would, uh, following up on what Pastor Bill just said, this is an amazingly surreal homecoming of sorts for me. I've actually attended church with Pastor Bill a couple of times, but not here, as he said, and not as an adult. I first met him somewhere between, I think we were determining, between 35 and 40 years ago, which I know is impossible for you to believe due to my youthful flowing hairdo. <laughs> but it's true. Uh, but back in Pastor's early Miami days at Bayshore Lutheran, I was a very spiritually lost teenager. I grew up with a Christian mother and a Jewish father, and both wonderful, don't get me wrong, but you know what happens sometimes in a house divided? I just was wayward when it came to God. I had conjured in my head, believe it or not, that even walking into a church or so much as looking at a cross was an offense to my father because of his Jewish background. It's so silly to me now, but it's just 
the truth back then. So my mother, Kathy, who you've met now, started attending Bayshore during a challenging seri- season in her life and marriage and then with us kids. And suffice it to say that I did not want to attend with her. And despite my best efforts to hate being in church, those few experiences planted a lifelong seed. And Pastor Bill, I wanted you to be so mean and scary just so I had an excuse not to want to go to church. But you disappointed me. Sorry about that. Instead, you were so kind and accepting, and you met me and my family just where we were at at the time and exactly where we needed to be in that moment. So thank you for that from the bottom of my heart. Lord, we pray. And Mom, I love you so much, and I appreciate you so much, and I want to thank you as well for that faithfulness of bringing your child to church even though he fought it. This is something I encourage now because even though she might have thought it was in vain back then, I've been a born-again believer for 25 years. Now I love being in church all the time, and I'm standing speaking in a church about working for a ministry. Only through God could that possibly happen. But that's the faithfulness. When you, you know, God's word doesn't return void, and when you raise up your children the way that you're supposed to, even the prodigals like me come back one day. And that has been an amazing transformation. And, and also, just so you know, that father that grew up in a very Orthodox Jewish lifestyle accepted Christ at the age of 75. So that's the importance of faithfulness in church. But quickly back to the work at Alliance Defending Freedom. Next year actually marks the 30th anniversary of this incredible ministry. It began with one attorney in one small office in Scottsdale, Arizona, with the goal of raising money to fund as many, the the defense of as many individuals as possible who were facing religious persecution. They had the, the founders like James Dobson and D. James Kennedy, they had the foresight to know it was coming onto our shores. That humble beginning, ADF is now the largest Christian legal advocacy firm in the world, defending a wide range of First Amendment issues. And only through God's providence, ADF now has over 400 employees in multiple offices across the globe, including over 80 staff attorneys, over 4,400 network affiliated attorneys, over 4,000 member churches, including this wonderful one right here. Of the 4,000, this is my favorite. and more than 300 other allied organizations that make up the vast alliance. We truly believe in that word alliance. But the frightening truth is, and Pastor Bill alluded to this in the sermon, is that due to the enemy's attack of every aspect of our culture, we're only scratching the surface of the resources and ground force needed to defend the gospel and our God-given and constitutional rights. It leaves one wondering how we arrived at this point in the United States of America. It seems as though it happened overnight, but of course it did not. Were we just not paying attention? Are we still not paying enough attention? Was Satan planning this all along? There are grains of the truth in all of that. And you might also be curious about some of our cases, many of which you've probably actually heard about, even if you haven't heard of Alliance Defending Freedom through the news. Or perhaps most importantly, you might want to learn what each one of us could do to make a huge difference in this battle for freedom's future. Because I am, I am telling you sincerely, everyone in the body of Christ, no matter the age, skill set, experience, time available, health, everyone can play a vital role and everyone must. The body of Christ must stand up. Well, I'm out of, town, uh, out of time for now, but don't worry, because all of the answers to those questions will be found after the service if you'll join us when Ryan speaks. And Ryan, I consider him to be just part of the family, a true brother and great friend, and he hates when I tell you this, so this is just between you and me. This is a secret, but he's the most inspiring and captivating public speaker that I know, an advocate for the gospel, so I truly hope you'll be able to stay for this treat. It's always a treat for me, and I've heard him countless times. It's all brand new to me. 
So thank you again for your generous support and partnership and for your hospitality today. Uh, I'm grateful for the privilege of this time and I hope to meet all of you afterward. And God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam. And uh, Ryan is from Houston. He came out here, not just for us, but we're certainly glad he was able to come as they have other meetings planned here. And uh, Ethan and his mom both live in the St. Petersburg area, so we're delighted to have them as well. Uh, at this time, uh, let us rise and join in prayer. You find the prayers printed on the center page of the bulletin. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For repentance, that by every thorn and briar, God would warn us of sin and discipline us against temptation, so that we would place all trust in his promises of everlasting life. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For devotion to the Holy Word, which God sends as abundantly as rain on the earth, that we may, may never take it for granted, but seek its help and refreshment in every circumstance, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For an abundant harvest of believers, that God would bless pastors and missionaries as they sow his word to the nations, preparing the hearts of all who hear to believe and yield abundant fruit, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For parents, that the Lord would bless them with faithfulness as they plant his word into their children. And for children, that by his word the Lord would protect them amidst the cares and troubles of this world. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For seasonable weather and bountiful harvest, that according to our Creator's word, he would send rain on the earth to make it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the seller and bread to the eater. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. To those suffering from illnesses of body and mind, as we have named them before you today, and others that we would name now in our hearts, that the Lord would give them healing, comfort them with his loving presence, grant them patience to endure suffering, and assure them always of the glory of Christ that awaits them. And for those that are suffering from natural disasters, including flooding and tornado, and other things that are so disruptive of life, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who partake of Holy Communion, that God would sustain his children in repentance and faith to receive Christ's body and blood for, the, for life and salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, your spirit calls us by the gospel to the new life of faith. We praise you and acknowledge you as our Lord. Deliver us from the devil's temptations, that we may live under you and serve you in righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, and grant your blessing on alliance defending freedom as they would stand beside Christian uh, individuals, uh, congregations, schools, and other organizations that are attacked for their faith. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, we would pray, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy and the same Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. We join now in the service of the sacrament. Call your attention to the statement regarding our practice of close communion. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing.
Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy you promised salvation by a second Adam, your son Jesus Christ our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night on which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do, <coughs> in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup when he had supped, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. This do, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
now may this gift of our Lord's true body and blood strengthen and keep you in the one true faith until life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. Let us rise as we conclude our worship. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn is On Our Way Rejoicing. We go out in peace and joy and are led forth in peace. Please join us for the luncheon, fellowship, and program which follows this service.
in peace. Serve the Lord.